Let's call the meeting to order at 6.05 p.m. Uh, let's approve the minutes. Any comments on the minutes from the meeting of January 14th? They were very good. All righty. Can I have a motion to approve? Yeah. Yes. So Bill, moved. Second. Second. I'll second. All righty. Uh, and roll call. Michael? Yes. Phil? Yes. Uh, Denise? Yes. Ashley? Yes. And I also, so it's unanimous. All righty. On to financial statements, and we already signed the warrants. Yes, uh, I do not have a formal report for you, but I'm happy to take questions. I did email you the expense reports through January 31st today, um, and you signed uh, five warrants totaling $33,448.04 since last meeting. Mm -hmm. Any questions financially? Well, the... I got some budget questions, but I didn't. We're not I mean, there yet. A lot of them, a lot of, a lot of them are going to pertain to uh, Kristen and Darius too, I suppose. Just yeah. the the, I don't know if everybody else saw the 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 budget narrative update that Shelly yeah. sent out today. Um, I did. I did. But the, uh, yeah. So. Do we want to wait for that until it's under new business and budget proposal? Yes. Sure. Good idea. All right. Great. All righty. So we're on to public comment. I did not get emailed about any public comment. Is that correct? Darius, did you get any? I have just checked with Don. There was no public comment submitted. All righty. So unfinished business. Uh, is a we have any representatives from the anti-racism and equity committee? Yep. Kelsey's supposed to be here. Um, I think you're, the kind of she comes a little bit a few minutes later because usually we have public comment and all the other stuff. So right, um, she doesn't realize think, how efficient Conway is. We are, so we can move on to the next thing. We can jump back. All right, COVID nineteen update. So um, the COVID nineteen update is right now we are um, the two things that update us on is pool testing and vaccinations, and so pool testing. The state really. Um, did not roll it out as fast as they said they were going to, um, in the sense that we got all the information about Wednesday, Thursday this week, or Wednesday, right? it was Wednesday because we sent out the email on Wednesday. Um, so we really couldn't do pool testing like on Friday, you know, we'd be the first day we'd get, you know, forms in and that kind of stuff. So, you know, we pushed it to the 22nd um, or the week of the 22nd and begin to roll out there. So right now um, for pool testing, we have the, you know, basically the electronic consent forms out there for people to for people to sign up on, and then we'll be rolling it out that week. Um, so this is meeting five, but this was also the last meeting where I knew more information about pool testing. So is there any questions about pool testing? Because I forget what I've said to this group, and I don't want to waste your time. <laughs> We're just a pilot for the state, right? Yeah, so basically what the state is, they said that we will pay for – they. Uh, they contracted with three companies and basically said, we'll pay for the first six weeks and they'll assign you a company and then you can contract with that company afterwards at your own dime. So we said, well, let's, let's you know, why not give it a shot? Um, there is controversy here. Not every district is saying, let's not give let's give it a shot. Um, it takes, there's a lot of work involved here. Um, but I kind of felt like it being free surveillance device that, you know, we could, possibly get up and running. Also, teachers aren't vaccinated yet. It's kind of a nice extra layer of protection as we get through the next, you know, six weeks. And then we're gonna have to decide as a district or each, actually each school can decide on its own, does it want to invest for the last 11 weeks after that? Um, Conway's cost on that would be about just under $8,000 to do pool testing for the remainder of the year. Um, now, mind you, if teachers get vaccinated and such, that number would go down because you'd have less people in the pool. Um, and that may not include everybody, but we just did the back of the envelope number. If everybody was to sign up, that's how much it would cost. So I, I you know, I think we'll we'll go through this and see if it's valuable information. Um, 
given the rates, you know, I have a piece of wood I always knock on when I talk about rates, um, you know, have been going down, down, down in Franklin County. And, you know, Conway has not seen a lot of COVID action within its school, which is a wonderful thing. Um, you know, it may not, we may find out after five weeks of, you know, tests that aren't telling us anything, we're telling us nothing, which is a good thing, that really this is not worth all the effort and the money. Um, or we may say, you know what, can we put that on hold? Can we do it with just a portion of kids and maybe rotate? Or maybe we put it on hold and use it if there is a spike in the community. And then we bring that in and just kind of kick that off to keep the schools going um, in person and that kind of thing. But those are different ideas that I can see kind of coming ahead. And I'm just, I'm really in every meeting saying, like, we're going into this not with the assumption that we're continuing it. We're going into it because it's free. We're going to see how effective it is. And then we're going to decide if this is a tool that we need to continue to use. Is it staff and um, teachers too, or just kids? Everybody in the, any, everybody in the person. So if you're remote, you can't come in and get that and be part of that. Um, and, and then also the way we do it is, you know, because it's surveillance testing, the pools are made up of not of similar types of people, so to speak. Like Kristen's not going to have like the nurse, her, um, the secretary and, you know, the whole front office be in one pool. Cause if it came out positive, that whole pool would be out, then who would be running the front office in, the, in that portion of the building? You know, so you do it by like grade level, that kind of, you would do all your teachers together. You do, you know, by class or you split a class in two, depending on the numbers. Um, to create two cohorts in one class. And that's basically how it does. And if, it, if a positive one comes up, we then do an antigen test on site. So we'd have the school class come early or however we kind of configure it. They would do the antigen test to find out, you know, who's positive. And then we would do contact tracing at that point to determine if the class had to be shut down or if the class could continue that one person's removed. If nobody comes up positive through the antigen test, you then can do another testing of the PCR test individually. So they allow you to do the testing right on site so that we can take care of it there. And then that, that class would probably, we'd probably keep that class remote, not knowing what's good. Although if the antigen test, we'd have to figure out exactly what we do with that class at a time, depending on what day of the week is and that kind of stuff. Um, and overall, you know, any other concerns and that could do it. So brings a lot of these, you hear me sit talking about, brings a lot of headaches with it, but you know, it also can, you know, there's a part of me, it's like, I'd be careful what I wish for here because this extra thing is causing a lot of work and may have false positives and this kind of stuff, you know, all the other things like that can happen. Um, but, you know, we're going to give it a try. I think it's worth it. Free testing for a community makes yeah, sense. Was, Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, I was just thinking that, you know, we'll also have to see the impact on the routine of, on kids. Like, you know, first graders are six years old and, you know, we'll just have to see what it's like for them to do this on a routine basis. Um, if it's feasible to maintain after the trial or, you know, to see, yeah. I think it's, I'm glad we're doing a trial, but I'm also glad it's a trial and we're not committing past that. So. Yep. And I think, um, you know, we'll see what the, what the, uh, you know, Kristen, I'm sure is, is part is obviously part of the one orchestrating it happening in her building, um, probably on the front line of orchestrating it happening in the building. You know, what is it, you know, is it, is this, is it, is it take as long as fluoride? You know, you know, basically the same kind of idea where we take a 10 minutes out of the week to do that kind of thing. Um, it's a, the system is very easy. It's a scan bar system. You know, everybody who gets scanned goes in. So your database is brought up to who's in each pool. Um, the people testing the pool don't even actually know who's in the pool. We do. And so, you know, it's very, uh, you know, it's a, hopefully it'll be slick. We'll see. And then the other thing was vaccinations. Um, you know, we're waiting on more and more coming to Western Mass. Um, I think I talked with Carolyn Ness, who's kind of running, is one of the people helping run Franklin County's um, distribution of it. She was going. They had a meeting. I think last tonight or last. I think it's tonight. They had a meeting. They're going to find out how many tests they're going to be getting the following week. So if it comes that where they were hoping to get three thousand, I think was we heard coming out of some of the legislative offices, um, that will start to speed up the 65 and over um, and then start to trickle in. We've already, you know, teachers are 65 and over as well, getting theirs and then um, hopefully thereafter. But everything's kind of getting pushed and it's kind of a six week process because it is Moderna, which is, you know, four weeks to the second shot then two weeks after. So 
the question comes up, well, what will school look like after that? Um, you know, we're going to start the, the, I say we're going to start that planning phase. And I know some people like, you haven't even thought about it. Well, of course we thought about it because we've done so many different models up to this point. Um, so, you know, we'll be kind of rolling out what that will look like, what will look like teachers coming back. Um, there's a lot of employment issues, employer issues that come up there um, after that that we're going to have to figure out as well. So um, we'll be tackling that. So questions whether or not we'll be tackling that middle April or May 1, hopefully it would be the last date. And then, you know, looking at what does the last six weeks of school look like and how will that may be different. Um, whether or not, you know, we come back on that Wednesday, there might be a, a strong factor to go five days a week. Um, and so on and so forth. So those are different things that we're going to be talking about. So more work, but that's the kind of work I think we want is like the challenges of getting everybody back and that kind of thing. It's better than how do we close it? Right. <laughs> so Darius, I'll ask you this now because it falls under the COVID-19 rubric. And that's, do you have any sense about um, whether or not the, it's going to be even in the realm of possibilities to have the town meetings in the school gyms? in June? So from a school perspective, you can do whatever you want in that gym on Saturday as a town, you own the building. So we don't, we're not, there, there's no, there, you know, where we were last spring where COVID sitting on surfaces and that kind of, it, they're just, the science is not there. It's an aerosol, you know, it's an aerosol based, you know, you know, that's how it spreads. You know what I mean? So if there, if a room has an ability to, to sit for six hours, the next person going in is not getting COVID from the person who was sitting in the room prior. Um, you know, they've kind of, they basically have said that that's, that's the way it works. They're not even talking about not talking about all the surface stuff and wiping our hands and all this stuff. Oh, well, it's good for everything else. They're saying that there's not a whole lot of evidence that's passing from surface outside of the laboratory. So saying all that, if you guys want the gym in June, you know, you're certainly welcome to take the gym in June, whether or not the general public will be vaccinated to a level where, they feel well, that's, I mean, that's that's the big thing. We were kind of thinking that by June it would be uh, well along because, like right now, all the gyms are rated rooms, rated capacity yeah. rooms. So right now, right now, you're allowed by the governor forty percent, um, which isn't enough, and uh, and it, it you know that's sort of indicating to people that it's not safe. And so if I mean, we're you guys are going to use the uh, garage again. I didn't. I didn't hate that last year. I thought that was. It was. I mean, even though it was kind of high, it was. I thought it was somewhat pleasant. I mean, that, it was, yeah, people were kind of vicious on the topics, but they were. <laughs> that, exactly. that will not be available. That will not be available. So I think we're going to be. I think oh, they the filled with are, trucks. Yeah, they right, filled with stuff. trucks and junk. Yeah, exactly. Three hundred thousand dollar toys. Yeah. 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 Or make them clean up their space, right? No. <laughs> oh no, no. I, I was pretty thankful. Uh, those big plows getting the last of the snowstorm out just this past week. So um, <laughs> it, was, it was slippery out there. You could actually leave your house, Michael. <laughs> I I made it off the hill. Yeah. There uh, you go. Yeah. Excellent. Yeah. All righty. I guess we are on to. The budget. Yeah. Okay. So I did send out, as Phil said, the um, budget narrative update um, for this meeting. I think Darius is going to share his screen so that we can all look at that together and talk through the changes that have been made since last meeting. So the top portion is just a reminder of what the increases look like and what the 21 budget approved was. Um, we did have our first draft in January uh, that came in at 6.29 uh, and the early childhood wages, the school lunch wages, and then that retirement payout. Um, just as a reminder, in case anyone wasn't listening uh, at last month's meeting, those early childhood wages and school lunch wages are normally paid from a revolving fund, which we have limited income from this year, given the COVID-19 crisis and the changes to those two somewhat independent programs. Um, so that was an addition to the budget. 
And uh, since then, since meeting, uh, we went back and did some additional work. So our draft two, um, you know, Darius and I talked about moving that retirement payoff off of the local budget and onto the school choice budget. Um, that's a perfect place for these type of expenditures to be paid. They're essentially one time unless you have somebody retiring every single year. So it's a good spot and a good way for us actually to use school choice reserves. Um, and then we did find out that there was a teacher retiring that came in after the first January meeting. So that was a significant savings to the budget um, because what typically happens with the retirement is that that teacher is at the highest step in the most advanced column on the salary schedule. And so when we anticipate rehiring for that position, generally we're looking at about a middle of the salary schedule. So I think it was a twenty-five dollars to $30,000 shift in um, salaries for that one position. So that was a huge savings. Um, so the budget there came in at 3.77 um, just about last week. And this is live working document. So Kristen and I and Darius and I have many conversations over the past couple weeks about where to go from there. Um, so there was the thought of, you know, reducing that 3.77 down further. Um, how would we do that? Or would we go forward with presenting that budget to the town if school committee was on board with that? Well, part of those discussions led to some other needs um, that Kristen feels are necessary in order for the school to operate at the highest potential next year. Um, and then one other piece came up that we learned about this new CARES Act grant. Uh, it's being called ESSER II, Funneling Through DESE. Um, it's another federal grant for COVID relief. Um, we do believe that we're going to receive enough of an award to pay for the early childhood and the school lunch wages. Uh, so we went ahead and moved those off of the general fund. And then with that, tried to address a couple of the other needs that Kristen feels are really important going into next year. So that actually brought the budget back up a little bit to 3.79 from 3.77. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that ESSER grant and why we made that decision. And then um, there is a little piece in here about um, those the new position and then the increase in the summer stipend line. But I'll really leave that to Kristen to talk about. Um, but if Darius, you can scroll down for me a little bit to the next part, that would be helpful as a reminder to myself. Um, so with this new grant, uh, the grant runs through September of 2023. So we could apply for funding in 21, which I don't believe we need at this point. We have some general fund savings from transportation fund, um, our transportation expense, and then some other line items. So I don't foresee us being in crisis right now and needing to access these funds. Um, the town has also shared that they may have Municipal CARES Act funds available. So Kristen and I are in conversation with Tom about accessing those funds if they do have them. Um, so I feel like we can put this off at least until next year. And then what'll happen is if we don't use all of the funds, it'll actually roll over for another school year and partially into 24 if we don't fully expend it. Um, and the, this grant was also similar to ESSER 1, could be used for PPE, social distance learning, cleaning, HVAC, really anything related to COVID. Um, but there is this line in there that is about uh, maintaining operations and continuity of services. So that would mean that we could actually use those funds to pay wages if we would otherwise be facing financial hardship or potentially talking about reducing personnel or programming. So that's where we started to have the shift um, once we found out about this of moving those revolving funds over. Um, it's a good use of those funds. I don't foresee and Kristen doesn't foresee any major needs um, next year for COVID. Of course, there's still some unknowns, but we really did well this year between municipal funding and then regular Conway Grammar School grants to take care of our COVID needs. You know, we wouldn't normally pay for salaries and wages from a one-time influx um, grant like this because you know, eventually we anticipate all of this funding is going to go away and we may not have it in the future, but it actually provides a perfect opportunity with the revolving funds to use them now and allow these programs to rebuild with the idea that in FY23 or 24, 
um, the funds can be more self-sufficient and those wages can get put back on the revolving account. Because we do anticipate that school lunch is going to return to some type of normalcy and start bringing in some revenue again. And same with preschool. You know, hopefully by fall we can open up the capacity of our preschool classrooms more and start generating some revenue as we had been in the past. Um, so that's the thought there. If you can scroll down a little bit more, I think, is there one more paragraph? So doing that, um, it really brought the budget when we pulled those pieces out down to less than 1% of an increase, which, you know, then really caused us to do some further thinking of, you know, last year we went in with a level funded budget. So there was, you know, essentially no increase to the town. Um, so started shifting gears and thinking about, okay, if we do have some new needs, what would those be? Um, and Kristen would really like to advocate for the hire of a new teaching position uh, as a teacher interventionist to um, address learning loss that children have faced due to the COVID-19 and the educational model and changes in education. Um, and then there's also some, you know, things historically that if the school could have afforded this in the past, um, it may have been something that we would have considered adding anyway, just to address typical math and writing needs. Um, and then the summer programming, I did increase the budget there in this proposal from 8,000 to 15,000. Um, Kristen's anticipating that we're going to want to expand the summer programs, not only um, to more kids, but also to allow for more time than we typically would in the summer for our summer programming. So again, that's addressing learning loss and, and any needs that are uh, have come up due to COVID. Um, and if there's any other questions about that, I'll allow Kristen to, and Darius to chime in there. Um, but that's a summary. So that's what we're looking at right now. Uh, 3.79. Um, obviously, we can talk about that number if it doesn't feel good to school committee, um, you know, how we bring that down a little bit so that we're going to the town with a number that feels good for you all. This is um, a realistic budget as it stands right now to meet all of the needs of the school next year. I'm happy to take questions if you have them or if, Phil, like you said, you have questions for Darius or Kristen. Well, if I can just take you back to the, to the difference between the draft two and the draft three page. Um, and the, the, uh, be, because I got my, my concern about sort of adding the position is that it seems like the room for that position in this year in the budget was created by smoke and mirrors. Um, and I mean, it just the, the, the draft budget two, at a 3.7, uh, 7% increase, had you, we moved the retirement payout into school choice, and then the early childhood and school lunch wages to the ESSER. And so that creates the room that for, for, for the teacher interventionist uh, and, and the other thing, but it doesn't look like those, I don't know how much of that is gonna be available next year. And does this set us up for like a mandatory big budget, big increase next year? I don't think so, um, because if, it, as long as we can continue to pay the school lunch wages and the early childhood wages from another funding source, then I don't think it's going to be an issue. Um, because we, you're right, we essentially moved those wages to a different funding source and then put the new teacher on there. It's almost dollar for dollar the exact same amount of money. Um, so as long as those school lunch wages and early childhood wages can stay on another fund, which I do believe that we're going to be able to rebuild the program. We're talking about 25,000. So that's one IA for um, preschool and then the 34,000 for school lunch and school lunch continues in Conway to be a discussion as to whether or not it should make money, who should pay for those wages. Um, so that could be the more challenging of the two to address. Um, but I don't really foresee it as an issue. The other thing is that if we did have to um, next year take on some of the school lunch wages again or the early childhood 25000 in wages, Conway has a really healthy um, school choice balance given the size of the school and the amount of school choice coming in. We're looking at the end of this year having around 300000 um, that could increase if our expenses go down. You know, we're always looking for savings opportunities. So we're bringing in 
or where our reserves are higher than one year of our revenue. So we're not overspending on school choice in Conway. So I do think even if next year we were in a little bit of a challenging spot, we could pay for a, a small portion on school choice to give preschool and school lunch another year to try to catch up. Um, so Phil, you're part of a lot of other conversations. So you kind of see like this bigger picture of things and in a different school, I probably would not be advocating this in several of our other elementary schools and maybe not even Frontier, but I think Conway is in a healthy enough spot where this is, if this is a true need, and I believe, you know, after talking to Kristen that it is, that I do think we can handle the addition of a, an additional staff member financially. Because this, I mean, I, 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 teacher intervention is, is, is a highly skilled staff member. That's not a fresh out of school staff member. That's, that's, I mean, I, I mean, I, I'm just looking at the chart that shows what your percentage increases would be for a budget budget and 3% is 58,000. I'm, I'm guessing that that position is right around the 3% of our budget. Um, uh, maybe more, I don't know, but, uh, so, so, and once once you embark down that path, then that expense is for sure certain to occur every year. Well, <laughs> I do think, it, and I know that Kristen has done this in the past because I think we did it. Oh, I'm sorry, Michael. I see your, your hand was up. Um, so last year we brought in um, a special education teacher, I believe that we paid from revolving fund and we went into that. Kristen had an open conversation that this was a one year position to make sure that the need was there and that financially we could continue to support it. I do think we could have that conversation in hiring this person. I think that there are some challenges with that, but it's certainly something we could broach that this is a new position for the school. Um, and just having a transparent conversation with that new hire about it could be a one-year role. But I mean, the flip side of that is that I wouldn't want to pretend that there is a financial challenge if in fact there is none. So, um, and that's what I'm trying to really get a grasp of because to, to, uh, uh, but that, that if, if the sources of funding are certain enough in your mind that this would not have an adverse budget impact, mm -hmm. And we wouldn't have to tell the person we're hiring that this is probably only a one-year gig. Because my guess that is that would be limiting the job pool. Um, yes, I would but, think it would be. Michael, you want to go so ahead? I, I'm going to just chime in here. Yeah. Um, so I have a comment and a question that relates to this. Um, the comment was, uh, thank you to all of you, all of those people that got us this grant. Like, this is a, a wonderful thing. So thank you. I don't know who was all involved in getting it written and submitted and stuff, but um, so uh, I'm just really appreciative that we did um, get awarded this grant. Um, my, when you first were talking about it, Shelly, I started to, I thought in my mind that the new teacher interventionist was being funded by the grant as part of the, um, you know, school distance learning, like, all of that. So it sounds like that's not the case, that it's um, not a grant funded position. It would be, we're, we're suggesting that the school create a position uh, that would be part of, of the school budget. Um, I, I personally have been concerned that um, we need to recognize and address that uh, more kids are going to be struggling and that intervention is going to be one of the most important things um, to kind of get us back on track. So I'm, I'm certainly in agreement with this um, need for an interventionist. Um, I feel like Conway, it's kind of interesting. You mentioned like other schools just aren't in a financial position to do this. And it, it does, you know, bring to mind like, some of the, for what is like the way our community is designed, we have to, we have these resources to do it. So I'm, um, what am I trying to say? There's some privilege that we are able, enabled to do this, right? But it's also, we have this grant and we're able to do those funds. Um, I do worry, 
similar to Phil that if it's not a grant funded position, then, you know, is our intention three years from now to continue this position and how is that funded? That was, yeah. Well, I would also think that having that position would make us even more attractive to school choice people. I mean, we're already attractive, but that would make us more attractive, which would help bring more funding into our school. Um, and also wings always brings in revenue to the school, which you think some of the money could from wings could go to pay a position like this at some point when we need it. I mean, so both of those seem like, yeah, yeah. and I, I agree with you. I mean, I think it's going to be needed, you know, no matter that Conway has done a great job of getting kids in the building more than most still what, you know, we're talking a year of this that I think kids are going to need a lot to get back on. Yeah. I, I think, I think when interventionists do is a very special specialized thing and they are a tremendous resource to the school they serve. Um, you know, you mentioned school choice and we're a small community. So we have a lot of open slots and we tend to fill those. Um, and I, I appreciate the income coming in. Sometimes I I think about the schools that are losing that income. It's not always a lot, but I mean, it, if it's a big amount of money to us, it must be a big amount of money to them that they're losing. So I just, I don't know. I, I think it's kind of a catch 22, but I recognize that our school is small and we have open, open um, slots that we can accommodate other students. So, so if I could respond, Elaine, um, so the grant is federally driven, Michael. So no, we didn't even actually have to apply for it. Money was just awarded to us. We're charging that application. <laughs> what? We're charging that application. <laughs> well, yeah, they, we are going to have to fill out an application, and there are going to be reports, but it doesn't change how much they're going to give us. They just gave us the award. Hey, whoever, whoever answered the phone and said, I, we'll won, take I it. won the grant, oh, my goodness, thank you. And then whoever <laughs> answered the phone, didn't miss that phone call. Thank you. <laughs> that was me. There you go. Um, but we'll take it because this is this is great. You know that the feds are giving another round of money, um, and so the position could be funded by the grant. We could leave the it, it's six and one half dozen in another, right? Because the dollar amount is the same. But this type of position would be a perfect um, reason to use ESSER funds. <laughs> It's the same for school choice and to pay for the 25,000 from early childhood because it would cause us some financial hardship. So, you know, it's really just a matter of what salary do we put on it? So that's not really gonna change anything. Um, you know, and again, I, I think um, if we did pay for it from the grant, you know, we would have even more backing if we wanted to say this is a one year position that is funded by the grant. We could leave the school choice and the early childhood on the general fund. Um, again, with the idea that the following year they're going to have enough reserves to move money back because we do expect those programs will build back up. Um, and then just looking and at grow. Right, exactly. Um, and school choice. So we are looking at um, over one year of reserve. So our anticipated revenue for FY22 is 250,000. And I am looking at the end of FY22, a projection of just over 300,000. So we're putting 50,000 to the good into savings. So it basically could pay for this position in the second year if we needed to, just with what we're going to have from next year's reserves. So, you know, I, I again, I don't think it's going to cause us financial hardship. I tend to be very conservative in budgeting, and um, I, I don't, I don't think I would be comfortable putting us in a spot where I felt like we were stretching too far. I don't feel like Conway's in that position financially. If we well, were not on this grant, it would be a different story, but you know, we're fortunate to have this grant this year to help us out. Elaine, I thought you'd be proud of me. This You've been with me since day one. It's the first time I ever asked for a position. <laughs> I know. I think it's amazing. I am very proud of it. And you. I was pretty stressed about it, but Shelly and I went over the numbers over and over again. 
very proud. It's, and perfect, of course, you would see the need. I mean, with what's going on, it's just, yeah. Uh, I guess, good job. And it, you know, it remains to be seen if we need, like, that it might be that kids need intervention for for five years or like like our first graders now, how long will they need intervention because of this interrupt interruption in their schooling? So it's I, I you know, I'm I'm looking forward to hearing more specifics about how this will be, come to fruition for our school. Because you have to re, um also it 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 wasn't just um it wasn't just the March to June, March to August, um, sort of, uh, you know, out of school time, but um, the times that the kid, the way that the kids are absent since this school year start, started are the sort of worst kind of ways. So I tell parents that, you know, if you're, if you're going on a trip and you're going to be gone for five days out of school, not that I promote trips, but I know little kids and families and, you know, um, we, we can, we can work that out. You know, we'll, we'll work that out, but this in and then remote and then in and then remote that's been happening through no fault of anybody's is sort of the worst way to get an education. So I can deal with the kids that's out for five days or, or 10 days because they had surgery or something, but it's, and when kids are remote, Certainly, there are some really great scenarios when kids are remote and they're hopping on and stuff, but some of those kids don't. They can't because they don't have internet service or for whatever reason. And it's not the same type of education. So not only do, do we have some lagging skills, which actually I'm really proud of the staff for the work that they're doing and the kids and the families, but we also have these interrupt this interrupted education this year that's going on, again, through no fault of anyone's. And that's sort of the worst kind of education that you that you, that you can get, and the hardest to fill those holes in. So I just want to say, within totally the number, if people agree with the supporting the position, so then I think that's probably kind of it's not really a vote, but discussion number one. You support the decision you want to, the position you want to put that in the budget. Um, you know, the number you know obviously right now is th is three <clears throat> three seven nine, so about just call, let's call it three eight. Um, you know, if, you know, Phil, you're going to be having conversations on the other end, if that number is, if that number has got to come down either by price or by optic, there's two different, two different reasons, ways we look at the number one, we can't afford it or two, you know, you know, three, eight is a little bit too much, you know, the summer programming, uh, we haven't really talked about this, Shelly and Kristen, but we could shift summer programming to school choice and pay for what's needed at a school choice instead of just budgeting straight up a higher budget and just pay as it's needed um and that would bring that that would bring that thing down to under three and a half um or even a little bit more than that actually doing the math it, it, and so i'm just saying that those are some going where how we where we have flexibility and still get what we want without much hurt but at the same time the positive sign to the, to the, the finance committee is that we are going to be building up our own school choice which means we don't have to go to the town as quickly in a problem Right. So it's one of the other. I, I I don't see the different that much of a difference in optics between three seven nine and three five or whatever. I I don't think it's worth a sacrifice to to get there when that, I I mean I, you know, yeah. you're still between I mean, three and four. Um, but and 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 actually you know between the frontier and and this budget you're under what the what the uh, what, what your placeholder mark was. Um, so, so that's good. That's Are you good. supposed just, to be sharing that information with us, Phil? That's, that's like giving away. I, I talk about secrets. everything. I talk about everything publicly to everybody. I, I, just, I don't got to worry about any of that stuff, but. But um, Elaine, the Frontiers assessment being lower is public knowledge though. So that's, yeah, that okay. came out on Tuesday. Yeah. So that's, okay. yeah. that's fair game. And I mean, and, and just so that you know, the Conway, a part of, for, for, uh, the the Conway part is uh, just a two two point nine per seven increase. Uh, if, just no zero point four three increase, a six thousand five hundred and two dollar increase from last year for for Conway's part of Frontier's budget. So that that's going to be well. That's because Frontier we got hit last year. We got hit hard. 
Well, and it's good. Sunder Sunderland's getting hammered this year, but they, yeah. they, they have an increase in students too. But yeah. um, so the, the, I guess my point is that this is a good budget year. And actually the tea leaves looking further, the, you know, we're just getting all these, the state's tax, uh, what the state is taking in in taxes is far surpassing what their own projections were. And they actually like, they actually did new projections and then, then the receipts are far surpassing the new projections. And, oh, so they're going to uh, lower our taxes, Phil? The, no, no. But the, from the revenue side, from the revenue side, it looks good. And then, you know, there is going to the, 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 the new, the new money that's coming down from Washington is, is headed in our way. It's going to be filtering our way too. This is the stuff from December. Um, the, the ESSER stuff, the, the, there's going to be a whole new trend of that. So those are all like good things. And, and town wise, our tax receipts are like the same as last year. So those are all like good portends in terms of overall, like fiscal health and everything. But the, I, I just, whenever you're like talking about increasing the, the bottom line of your budget every year in terms of what you, you know, you're going to be spending. Um, I always just try to really go in with eyes wide open and make sure that it's not going to bite us in the butt in the future. That's all. And well, I also think the idea of, you know, when you're adding something in a year, like going through a pandemic, there'll be questions about it, certainly at town meeting, but we certainly have, you know, good, a good case to say, look, we're trying to get our kids back on track, you know, intensively instead of waiting to see the gaps get wider before we do something about it. So, and I think our, our town will make some comments about that, but ultimately they will understand that that's the best investment with kids is to get on it sooner rather than later, you know, don't let the gap get bigger. So, yeah. And, and then just for the town budget, I mean, the, the highway department's trying to get a new truck through. No. And, 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 I'm going to take a quick turn, okay? What? I just I, I put that hand icon up just so I could ask Shelly a question. Is that cool? Oh, yeah. Okay. But we're also, uh, Shelly, we're also is, is the 3.79, does the 3.79 include the revenue from the grant? And do we know how much revenue is from the grant? Is it like dependent on how much you spend or is it does it have a ceiling? Um, the 3.79 has those, let's call it 60,000 in wages moved over to the grant. Um, and the grant is supposed to be 85,000. And usually you have to show so, the grant that you're using it for the these particular things, right? For right. pandemic relief kind of Correct. associated things. Right, right. And so... I guess the 3.79 is 85,000 of that increase funded by the grant. Like, like it looks like a big increase, but is that a funding resource that's part of that increase? No, that numbers, that, that the budget numbers, we spent the grant money in the budget already before you got to that number. And there will be some grant money remaining that we still can use until 20, September 23. Okay, so in that grants, in order to get 3.79, we already spent the money to lower it to the 379. Does that make sense? Yes, to me it does. Michael? And, and that's, yeah, Michael, that's that, kind of why I said that I, there's, I smoke, there's smoke and mirrors involved. That's kind of why I said that there's like smoke and mirrors right, to it a little bit. Yeah, this is not. That's not a negative. That's just like the the fine part of budgeteering. Right. Right. right, because I mean, if we didn't have that grant and we were asking for this position and the extra money for summer, we'd be looking at almost seven percent. We'd be at roughly six point eight. So, if we didn't have that money, we'd be in a much more challenging position. We probably wouldn't even be asking for the extra teacher. Right. Well, we wouldn't be asking, and that's why it wasn't brought up first because the right. number was too high. <laughs> then you ask for a teacher, you're right, it's a three percent right. ask. And so you're not gonna have the ability to add on a teacher without an external funding source 
in a community this size, unless you're adding a full class of kids or something of that sort to, to match it. And that's quite frankly, I will give you the example. Sunderland has to add a teacher and they also have the same COVID numbers. And so they're at seven and a half percent or something like that for their elementary school where they're starting because they have to add a teacher because of the number of students they have, but we don't have any offsetting funding. So yeah. Um, and that as far as what number, I mean, the town always likes like under a three, but if we're not going to get under, you know, three or under, then I don't think there's much difference between, you know, three, one and three, five and three, seven. I mean, I don't know. I mean, maybe it makes a little sense to squeak it under three, five, but I'm not, Phil might know the, the thought about that more if I, I haven't talked to the finance committee or whatever, but. Well, and the good news is, is we have time, right, Phil? The sure. town meeting's not till June. So, sure. you know, there may be some more savings in the general fund budget, which will allow us to increase our school choice savings. And if that's the case, then we could decide to pay for a portion of this teacher or all of the summer programming, like Darius is suggesting, to bring that number down a little bit. We don't have to decide on this tonight. Right. Um, and we'll certainly keep working at the administrative level. And who knows, maybe more funding will come out between now and when we meet again in April or even in May. So, you know, we don't we don't have to decide on this this evening. Yeah. Well, I think I think we're in pretty good shape at this point in time. So any other questions, discussion? Yeah, if I could throw one, throw one more at you, is that so right now, you know, Donna kind of, she maps out the school year and, and normally March is when we have our public hearings on the budget. So, you know, in order to do a public hearing, you guys, as you know, that we have to post it in the paper um, seven days prior. Um, I think we've been doing it 14 days prior, but I think it, it, seven days is the law. And then, um, so like what month do we want to, I gotta kind of know to do that because if we forget, we get ourselves in trouble. And then we also have to give our time to meet with the um, select board and finance committee who usually want to come to us as well. So just kind of help me map this out. We're probably having a joint meeting in April because that's what we're scheduled to now. We have some joint work to do. Um, but quite frankly, the way things are set up and we get a public hearing in May. Yeah. But or do we bother waiting? Do we wait that long or not? You know, this is where we do. We, do you want to do the public hearing in March and get it over with? I mean, your, your budget's not that complex. You know what I mean? <laughs> if, 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 it, if we're not going to gain any more budget clarity by waiting, then I mean, just I think it would be better for the town to be able to complete our budget process while we still have a town administrator that does it. Um, because well, but it's, he's it, only around like another month, right? Well, it's six. It's going to be sixty days' notice from the date he signs his new contract. I, I, but it's it, you're basically talking about like two more months, and and then and then putting together the budget falls to people to whom that is not their job, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, like you know, like me and um, and other volunteers that might step up and turn the computer on and try to make it happen. And, um, <laughs> so. <laughs> uh, so th there is sort of an incentive to get it squared away before, before then, but just to avoid potential so I, first. So then I ask oh, yeah. back to we: Do you want to just do the public hearing in March? You move it I, forward. I, I, At our yeah, March I mean, meeting. It we usually we make the March meeting. We have the public hearing to start the meeting, and then we vote the budget thereafter. But yeah. the turnaround time for the towns people the. Your, the, your your select board in FinCom is going to be tight because right now you guys are you guys are scheduled when the town meeting you mean no you're March 18th so we actually have sorry we actually have plenty of time you're March although I could click over to the calendar on my computer instead of getting up across and across let's not go there all right so <laughs> <laughs> um, March 18th. So you're actually the latest. You're the latest school committee meeting in March. Um, so March 18th, we could technically, the week prior, our select board and FinCom's ready to start having conversation on budgets themselves. Phil, in, in Conway, they are. Yeah. In Conway, so, they are. All right. Then, if you guys are going, let's keep the original schedule, and we'll have the public hearing before the meeting of the 18th. And we always can change it. Just we have to have seven days' notice. Or more because Donna's got to do the work of putting in the paper and stuff. And then you can skip the separate 
in-person meeting, if we just re reach out and invite them and just try to get them on the call, then you don't have to repeat it in a month or so. And right. And the other side is you always can reduce your budget. That's that never, they were people. So I mean, we're, that's why we're that's talking true. about it. You right. know, if, if, if things get a lot better, that kind of stuff, we can say, oh, and you know, we have a contentious com conversation with FinCom, then we could sim we can simply just say, you know, we're able to reduce it by a half based on that's this, true. And, and that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Everybody take that sounds like a good plan. Sounds like a decent plan to me. I mean, if we can, if we're going to change it only down, not up, then why not go forward? Yeah, I, I agree. Okay. All right. We good for budget for now. Um, are we going back to anti-racism or on to yeah. new business? Kelsey's here. So if we could do that, that'd be great. Okay. I hope Kelsey's here. I see your Yep, I'm here. I apologize that I'm a little bit tardier than I usually am. <laughs> um, so hello, everybody. Um, so a couple of updates with um, the anti-racism committee. Um, our elementary school teachers are doing an amazing job with their professional development. Um, so they spent the fall kind of focusing on um, self-reflective work. Um, and now they are working with um, Amanda Mazea, Sapphire DeJong, um, and Ramina from the Northampton Collaborative um, to start looking at their curriculum and thinking about, okay, how do we bring this into the classroom? Um, so that's all really exciting. Um, at Frontier, we have two classes um, that have been approved for next year. We have an African-American studies class that has been added, and we also um, our peer leadership group is going to be turned into a formal class um, called uh, medium, Media Activism and Social Change. Um, so we're really excited about that, and that's good news for the elementary schools because that means that we will have designated time during the school day um, with our peer leaders so we can say, like, all right, today we're going over to Conway and we're going to meet with the sixth grade class and do some discussion circles. Um, it also opens the door for the elementary schools to start their own um, leader groups in, in their older grades that our students can mentor. So I'm, I'm excited about that. I think we have some good opportunities um, with that. Um, and then our, our peer leaders have been leading um, the discussions in during C Block, uh, which is sort of our study hall. So that's been continuing in February. Yesterday was our highest turnout. We had 40 students um, basically during their time off during the day um, choose to come and talk about um, privilege and intersectionality, which is really exciting and really shows us that our students are ready to have these conversations. They're interested, they wanna know more. Um, and I was particularly excited about our conversation yesterday because when we were talking about intersectionality, we were using a resource that I didn't see until graduate school. And we had ninth and 10th graders that were looking at this resource. Um, so that's amazing that they're seeing it so early and that they're starting to think about these things um, from such a young age. So that's really exciting. Um, so I'm sure many of you are aware of the school committee meeting uh, from Frontier where Amanda gave us some pretty candid feedback. Um, and I think the, the big takeaways for me from that um, was that we need to do better with communication. So we've already been talking about, all right, how can we put together some kind of newsletter or maybe a website, um, some kind of centralized source so that everyone can update each other on, this is what we're doing at all the different schools, teachers can update, this is what I'm doing in my classroom. Um, and our community members can see this is what's going on in the school so that there's transparency and there's clear communication um, between all of the schools and all of our stakeholders in the community so that they really know what we're doing. Um, and I think the other, the other thing is that, yes, we've done a lot of really amazing work this year, which again is incredible because it's been such a crazy year and it would be so easy to just say, it's too hard, we'll do it next year. Um, but a lot of the things that we have done are not systemic. So we need to start thinking about, all right, this is great. How do we make this sustainable? How do we make sure that what we're doing right now is still happening five years from now? Um, so it's kind of time to take stock, reevaluate where we are and think about 
where we want to be and how we're going to get there. And I'm happy to take questions. Is uh, Black History Month something that's a big deal in terms of curriculum going on in the schools at all? We did send out um, a resource list at the beginning of the uh, of the month that's saying it's Black History Month and here are a whole bunch of resources for how to bring it into your classroom. Um, and in that memo, we also talked about the fact that um, in an ideal world, Black History Month is not the only time that we're talking about Black history, that it should be fully integrated into our curriculum. Um, and that really Black History Month should be a month to highlight certain, um, certain scientists or writers, um, musicians, really highlighting um, Black leaders and, and Black creativity and Black um, excellence. I agree. Any other questions? Um, yes. Go ahead, so, I, so um, I, I thought Amanda's presentation on Monday was breathtaking. I loved it. Um, and I, you know, I, I, I understand though that like, you know, if I'm working in the building, I, I want my, my contributions and my hard work to be recognized in some extent and not, um, you know, but, uh, but, it, but at the same time, you know, it, that, the, the, what's so wonderful about like her presentation is that palpable sense of urgency. Right. And, and, and like, and what that is going to, that sense of urgency will always face pushback when applied to an institution. Um, and, and, you know, it, it just will like if, if everybody, you know, if we think that everybody should feel comfortable about the process that's going on about everything about, then we're doing it wrong. Like the whole thing is to get people uncomfortable to find out where, you know, where those zones are for each person and like that's all part of it so like i i um i, I thought that that whole like you know just let it rip attitude is just is, was just breathtaking and wonderful and necessary and useful and um you know it, like and, and when i hear you say that it's not systemic you know like that it brings up like you know how can how how can what can we do at conway to make it does that also apply to Con what what can Conway specifically do to make it more of a systemic thing? Is it is it is there some that are doing better than others? What are we doing about that and all that? And, um, and that you know, the, it, but the communication part too is such a challenge in this area because it's challenging enough just trying to communicate with the school community, and we have enough obstacles. But this is an issue that the whole community at large is really tuning in on. And we just have no even prior history of trying to communicate with that. And it's so difficult to do just as a town official, it's, you can't get your community. Everybody, we, our, our, our ability, the way we cross take in information is so fractured. Every, you, you know, a letter works, you know, sending a first class letter only works for like 10% of people. Everybody else seems it's junk mail. The, you know, for personal phone, call, nobody, you know, it's you got to do all of the above each of one of these techniques you get, you know, it took takes, you know, man hours per people hours to do. You get like 10, you get like it's exhausting and difficult and you still end up with half the room screaming. Nobody told me no matter what you do. And and, and so like I, there, there are so many issues with this. But what what I do like to what, what I was like interested about with Amanda and also you is when, when you say, you know, it's not systemic enough yet. And I just, that just is like, what can we do to make that more systemic and what can we do to help that along? And, and what can we do to highlight some of the good work that's been done too? I'd like to hear some of that example in, in, in our building. Right. 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 Michael, did you have something too? Yeah. Um, I actually was not, I did not know about Amanda's presentation. So, um, I don't know that first reference. I missed. I missed it. I missed the event. Um, so, if there's a way to see that, I guess I can look for the recording, or if there's a, if it's a something that was um, more like a slideshow or something. But um, I, I would be very open to more communication um, and how that's done I, I wasn't sure if there's anything the schools or the district can do internally to support that um 
I, I know in the school building that I work in, we have an internal Google Classroom that we made as a repository that all the staff can access. So at least internally, um, we can have that as a hub to communicate and it's administered. It's like administered by all the curriculum leaders and then all the staff are kind of like students on it so we can we can see it. Um, and then how do you commun communicate that outside of the school to the community at large? I think, you know, it wouldn't have to be all of that. It would just be the key highlights um, so that there's, you know, some things that are part are really more internal to the school. Like what is the school trying to do systemically? Um, so I was wondering, maybe it's a question for Darius, if like a Google Classroom as a repository or some other thing that's just an example could be used in that way. Um, and um, I'm a math teacher and I'm really thinking hard about how math curriculum does not address anti-racism. And um, so I'll be interested to see what our school community comes up with in all the subjects. Um, but, you know, personally for me, I'm interested in math and how that gets brought in. Um, my math department, we're talking about financial literacy. Financial access to financial literacy is key to participating in society. And um, if there are systemic issues with that, what are we doing in the math curriculum to fix that? That's, that's like an example. So um, thanks for coming on and sharing. Absolutely. Um, so in, in terms of how we're thinking about communicating, um, definitely multiple methods, because just like Phil was saying, you know, everyone receives it differently. Um, so we were thinking maybe a monthly newsletter that kind of highlights like, hey, this cool thing is going on and maybe gives like one resource, one cool video, one something to interact with um, that just kind of keeps people engaged, keeps it on your radar. And then having either a Google Classroom, that could be an interesting idea, or a website or something that's a little bit more static and a little bit more, um, more content heavy that has more of the details. Uh, because I think it's it's gonna it's helpful if you know if you find out that oh well Sunderland just revisited their diversity statement and updated it like that's cool let's take a look at what they did and see if we want to incorporate that in what we're doing. Um, I think knowing what other schools are doing, knowing even in the in the building, knowing what other teachers are doing, um, can really help kind of spark ideas and make people and also alert people to oh all right this teacher is doing something cool in their classroom that's a good resource for me that's a good person for me to connect with and talk to and see you know okay where did you get this information how are your students digesting it have you gotten pushback from parents um, just kind of highlighting for us you know where where our resources are uh, within our own community of colleagues Any other thoughts, questions? So um, Darius, is the presentation from Monday going to get posted somewhere or are you going to scroll through the meeting to get it or? The Frontier presentation? Yeah. So Amanda, Amanda really didn't, not to take away from, Amanda gave the uh, anti-racism update and gave some of her feedback with it. There was no real, it wasn't like a slideshow of facts and figures and that kind oh, of stuff. Okay. So it was more in it, it it brought on a conversation to follow that lasted about 45 minutes after. So it was a, okay. Um, you know, I, I think it's right now, I think Kelsey a lively kind of, discussion. Yeah, it was a lively discussion. I think Kelsey brought up kind of, you know, where we're at within this, you know, it was a hurry up and start this year to get this thing rolling. And we are, at, we are at a spot where I think Kelsey's kind of talking about is that we have to kind of assess where we're at and then it's kind of plot forward. And in that, you know, we have things set up for, systematic change, but it, I think we have to organize exactly what that looking like and talking about how we're moving the curriculum, how we're doing their professional development. That's all stuff that's naturally coming up in the calendar in our planning anyways, but it's also we reached the half year mark. And so we kind of have to, and then we have to communicate all that because we know a lot more than what, you know, what we share at each meeting is a snippet, but when you don't see it all together, it kind of feels like, you know, scattershot. And so we kind of, we have to be able to put that out there for people too. So. I think um, we're kind of like hitting their second 
second gear of a lot of work that we're doing moving forward here. And so you'll, you'll be hearing from us um, next month. And then at the joint meeting in April, um, I think is where we'll kind of roll out what the PD plan is. We have to do the calendar, which is connected directly to that. Um, and PD is going to help, uh, you know, basically drives the boat on what you're doing for direction. Mm -hmm. And then from that, um, you know, obviously curriculum development is going to be in that and, and where it is, where and how are we going to fit this in and do the training for that as well. So there's a lot of work in that end as well. So yeah, it's a lot, there's a lot going on and it's, it's bringing it all together here. And I think, um, I think the, the frontier meeting showed that we need to kind of, it is taking a time, to, there's a time to tighten it up, better communicating what's going on out there. And then also internally, you know, tighten up what the next step is moving forward as well. So is it a, a <laughs> accurate reference or to, to say inference really to say the elementary schools are jumping on more enthusiastically than the middle school and high school, or is that not accurate? No, I don't think it's, I don't think it's accurate at all. I, I think they're in different, they're different. They did different professional development. And so, um, and so frontiers working, you know, and Kelsey, you probably can talk a little bit more about this because you're more intimately involved. So can I hand it back to you? Kelsey, can you talk a little bit about what the frontier is doing with, I mean, they, we brought in new masks. Sure. Uh, Kels, can I just tell you one quick thing, you and Michael, um, just so you know, the elementary school, we do have a Google classroom that teachers, um, that staff can go to and all the information's in there too. So. Nice. Um, so there, the elementary school and the high school approached PD very differently. Um, the elementary school kind of broke into small groups. They had a lot of small sessions. Um, they focused on reading some books and doing a lot of reflection sessions. The high school, I think we had four total um, half Wednesdays that we did some, some PD work, one of, one of which was the, the launch one that we all did together as a district. Um, so all told, the high school has only spent about four hours of anti-racism PD so far this fall. Um, and it's, it's good PD. The, the UMass consulting firm that we're working with is very good, but it is a limited amount of time. So there is a sense that the high school hasn't done quite as deep of a dive as the elementary school. So elementary school teachers are feeling a little bit more ready to bring this into the classroom, whereas high school teachers haven't had quite as much time or depth to digest it. So there's, there are a number of high school teachers who are still feeling a little bit nervous about bringing this into the classroom a little bit unsure of okay how do i how do i have an anti-racist curriculum like what exactly does that mean what exactly does that look like um and i think and and this might just be my my bias but i feel like um elementary school teachers have a little bit more um more flexibility and more um more room to be creative in bringing curriculum into a, into the classroom quickly um, you know, because it's, it's your classroom and you get to decide how much time you spend on things and, and you can kind of control that a little bit more. Whereas the high school, the curriculum is much more, you know, often we're teaching to MCAS or you're doing an AP class that has a, a prescribed curriculum. Um, so it can feel a lot more intimidating to bring something new into a high school course. Um, so I think that's, that was a little bit of the, the PD discussion. Um, so the elementary schools have sort of started more from the teacher side. Frontier has kind of started more from the student side. A lot of what we've done so far this year has been student-led, student-driven. We're doing student discussions. Um, we're doing the, the film screening that we did, the logo design by students. Um, and that's, that's really exciting and it's really wonderful. Um, and we're also thinking, okay, if we were to, if we were to stop talking about anti-racism, have we made any changes that would carry it forward without our continued attention? Um, so that's kind of the next piece that we're looking at is like, okay, now we need to, we need to put some things in writing. We need to put some, some structures in place that will make this sustainable. That's a very helpful distinction about how they're, yeah, thank you. And thanks for the great work. Uh, any other questions, discussion? Where we let Kelsey go for the evening. I, I would say to everybody though that listening that that it's worth it's worth looking up um, the Amanda's presentation. It's just okay. a few minutes long, ever, but it's the way she tell her story 
and, it, and its history with Frontier um, yeah. is just yeah. worth your time. Yeah. Worth your time. And, and you're right, Phil. That that urgency that she brings um, as a person of color uh, is is really important, and it's something that we. Because yes, um, institutions do take a long time to change. We're not going to fix this overnight. Someone in my our, our committee meeting earlier today said, you know, we're not going to fix it in nine months. We haven't even fixed it in 400 years. Yeah. So, so yes, it's a long game and it takes a long time. But also, we do need to not lose sight of that sense of urgency. Um, right. That even even as we're doing the work, it's possible to become complacent, and people Absolutely. like Amanda kind of keep us from falling into that trap. Yeah. Absolutely. All righty. Thank you very much for your report. And we look forward to more in the future. All right. Thank you so much Thanks. for your support. Thank you. Good night. Uh, good night. We're on night. to new business, which is any SDEC enrollment projections. <laughs> Everybody looked over the slides. <laughs> so, yeah, basically, um, as I said to the other ones, I pass this on because we pay for it. I find it useless. And I want to leave Nasdaq. <laughs> It'll save our district two thousand dollars. I think they all Fight look the, the same every year, personally. Fight the power. The, uh, the numbers it has like Waitley growing by like one hundred and fifty kids over the next seven years. Like we'd have to build a second story on the building. It has Frontier growing by like eighty kids by growing by eighty kids in population in in three years. Well, there's not 80 kids extra coming up through the system. So where are they coming from? So their right. data is just garbage. And so, I mean, they're seeing trends, which is interesting, but I think we can find other articles on the internet to see what the population trends are in New England. Yeah. Um, and, you know. Pandemic baby boom. Yeah, there might be one. Yeah. <clears throat> or not. <laughs> I'm so or not, sorry. yeah, or not. I know there's a, I know there's a puppy boom because you can't get a puppy anywhere. There is a puppy boom. That is true. Let's hope they all get taken care of after people go back to work. <laughs> there seems to especially be one in my house. Yes. <laughs> so, Mine too. So there is. She said that. <laughs> are, are we required to be a member of this? No. I don't, I don't believe so. I talked with another superintendent who's thinking the same thing. Um, I was like, do we, am I missing something here? Are they providing services? Because I saw the bill and I was like, you know, I know they help with like, if you're hiring, larger districts use them a lot to hire principals and superintendents and that kind of stuff. We use MASC for superintendent, at least in the past we had, in the most recent past. Um, we don't really use that for principals because, you know, you're going to get your principals more locally than you're going to have someone, you know, that kind of thing. But um, I don't know. And so we, and so I asked a, a fellow superintendent about it. He's like, I don't see the benefit either. Mm -hmm. uh, their data has always been off. So All righty. we look forward to not seeing them next year. Yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, Reports. Oh, you want to say something else, Michael? No, no, it was just okay. a funny joke. Um, we have uh, Kristen, your principal's report. You sent it to us ahead of time with lots of fun technology to click on. <laughs> yeah, so I gave you an update on the school improvement plan. If anyone has questions, the wellness. Um, we're going to be doing our assessments this month in early March. The NIWA, the reading benchmarks, math assessments, writing prompts. So I'll be give you, able to give you a data review and uh, March. The most exciting thing that's happened at Conway Grammar School is, yay, the touchscreen Chromebooks came in for K1 and 2, and it has been a life changer for them. So they're, they're Chromebooks, and they have a barcode. Each of them has an individual barcode, and they swipe, and everything comes up for them, and all of their passwords are in each of the programs. And I have those little kids thanking me every day, I felt like. But they have been a game changer for, oh, um, yeah, for remote learning and even um, some learning platforms in the classroom. So we're excited about that. Just wanted to update you quickly that um, Tom Hutchinson said that we could do the carpet replacement in the library, even if it's after June 30th. But we're going to start right away. Uh, we're also, while we're at it, Bruce said he'll paint the walls. and. Um, and so we'll have a new looking library. We're excited That's about That's awesome. Can't wait to be back in there for meetings. I know. Yep. 
Awesome. Yes, do we feel like the, um, you know, we'll have to see the results of the district assessments, uh, but it may make it clear that, yes, we definitely need an intervention position. We'll see how things have changed, right? Yep. And I, I have to say, I, I saw Daryl Chase about the hand dryers because he did some work on my house. <laughs> and he has forgiven me. Um, but especially now with COVID, those would be the worst thing in the world, blowing all those germs around the bathroom. <laughs> I mean, that Darius did all that footwork and Elaine comes back at the day we're going to vote and she says, no, we can't have these. And you were right. No, but so I'm so glad I did. <laughs> Daryl was like that. Daryl was like that was you. I'm like I'm so sorry. That was great. <laughs> I'm I want so that. Glad I, want that I, I want those problems myself. again. I want those I problems again. We're fighting over hand dryers or not? I know. No kidding. Oh, crazy. Um, but before our agenda ends, um, I wanted to ask. I got a letter about a. Um, sorry, let me get it. Uh, just a uh, uh, advocacy for an MCAS moratorium, and I was wondering if that was going to be on next month's agenda. If it's something that we're going to be looking at or not. I thought they already canceled it this year. No, they um, they um, came back and said we're going to do a shortened version because it needs to be, uh, and the data we have will allow us to blah de blah de blah. And I was like, are you kidding me? So. Um, so it is a real issue. That's a, that's um, a silly waste of school days. It's, it's, um, there are districts, larger cities in Western Mass that are fully remote at the moment. Um, MCAS can only be administered in person. So is this yet another push to force schools that are not in a position to be in person to go back in person? Um, there is, uh, I mean, well, you know, we've heard about getting rid of regulations for other things like busing and stuff like that. So if, if, um, I don't know, I, I just feel like, uh, it's worth looking at this. Um, if it's something that we want to support as a school committee, uh, maybe we could look at it at the next meeting or something. Kristen or Darius thoughts. I, you know, I, so I, I look at it different different lens. Um, they are reducing the length of tests and they're doing a smaller test sessions. Um, you know, I want, I want that data. Um, I want even, it's only one snapshot, but um, you know what, when we had kids at home on computers and back and forth, you know, what measures are we gonna see where our kids are compared to previously standardized testing? And they're not holding schools accountable to it. So it's not a high gotcha test against teachers. I think we're going to score very well comparative to the state. And you're talking about there are some communities who, who barely are open in comparison to what we've been. Um, and our online model is robust in comparison to what some other communities are. So I'm not worried about comparative scores, but I am worried about like, so how do we know next year that, that Susie needs help in math compared to where we were before the pandemic? The teachers, the teacher has an assessment of where they are in the curriculum, but you don't have that strong data. And I think parents, well, this will be a parent decision because the state's not going to cancel it. So the parents would have to decide to do that. Um, and so the, I think as a parent, I want to know where my kids stand. What, how did this year go? You guys keep on telling us we we're doing great, but really? And then where do we, where do we need to do our work next year? Um, and it's only one snapshot, but it is, you know, if there's, you know, there's glaring things, teachers don't, we don't grade teachers on it. The teachers go, they sit down, they look at their list, and then they break down by question. And then they say, oh, you know, they had trouble with this particular, they had trouble with fractions. Well, you know, we never got to fractions this year. So there's no, no kidding why that was the problem. You know, but we may have to double that up next year or, you know, make sure that we go back to that, redo it. I don't know. That's how I feel about it. Um, I know people are saying, you know, you're lose, you know, class time and such. I mean, it's online. It's a much more efficient test than it used to be. Um, but, you know, then again, you know, that's just my opinion overall. I think that, you know, the group that's pushing it, 
I don't know what they're they're interested. They call it a cruel test. I may have two kids. They're they're in the middle of the testing window. They don't find it cruel, but um, well, what I, I was, yeah, what I would like to do, I I will personally because there's mention of the MASC. So I'm going to look up and see if the MASC is asking for a moratorium or not. Um, if there's, I'm going to, I have co colleagues in Holyoke that I'm friends with and other uh, cities around Western Mass. I, I'm going to see what their districts are trying to do, if it's a thing or not. So if um, I'm, I work in special education, I understand the lens of is this fair to do right now with special education students? Is this fair uh, from an anti-racism -rac systemic issue? Is this test, are, I, I have no guarantee that the people who are writing these questions are doing this through the lens that is uh, fair across all, um, I can't think of the right word, but basically, Stakeholders, all the stakeholders, all the families, regardless of income, race, like I, I just don't know. So maybe I'm talking a little bit from my own personal experience and from do you use, me personally. Do you use MCAS data? Do you use MCAS data to help drive instruction as, with your students? Yep. Yep. I do. Well, so you're gonna go year, you're gonna go next year without that if we chose not to go there. <laughs> Well, I mean, we're we're going forward with it because we didn't do it this past spring. So I right. I think oh. that I think that we as a community and a society are thinking about what does the data give us. Uh, you know, we are, we're so fortunate here in Conway. We do the NIWA and we do all these other tests. Is that more informative than what MCAS gives us? And That's they're doing a shortened version. They're saying it's going to be. Right, so they're saying MCAS is going to be shortened, but it still be valid. I don't know if that's going to be the case or not. So um, it re I think it remains to be seen if we do it, what kind of information it gives us. But um, you know, I've, well, Michael, I've been so thankful. Michael, why don't you thankful. put it on the agenda yeah. for business next month and gather more information, and we can take it from there. Yeah, it may not be something that we vote on, but it might be something that's just a some type of presentation or something. Yeah. Okay. I'm good with that. Uh, Kristen, were you done with your report? I am. Thank you. Unless anyone had any okay. questions. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Darius, you, do you have a report? How about just, just a little, how about just a, a, a brief um, about the summer? The, what's the summer increase in, in, in the budget? I wanted to ask you about that, Kristen, the summer program. What, what was that about? Yeah. So, there again, um, it's we're hope we're hoping that well we're going to have a summer program. We're hoping that we can include more kids than we have in the past. You know, we're hoping we can uh, include close to double the number of kids that we've had in the past, and then we're hoping that we can have it for a longer period of time. Whether that means longer days or longer, um, w you know, more number of weeks. Um, but just more time um, with the kids this summer. I'm sure some of them will need it. Thanks. So. Thanks. Yeah. All right. Uh, any collaborative report? Um, well, the collaborative we met at the end of January. It's a very long meeting. <laughs> Six long. to nine after being on my screen all day. Yeah. But um, what I can say is that. Um, the interim director did send a spring PD um, brochure to me as well as like an annual highlight and a director's report. So in case you don't have that, I can forward those along. But they they talk about a lot in the, in the three hours. So yeah, um, they do. Formative. It is. Great. It really is. They yeah. do a lot of good work. They do. Yeah. Thanks for doing that. Thanks for representing us. All right, if there's nothing else, uh, I would take a motion to close the meeting. So moved. Second. Second. All righty, all in favor, uh, Michael? Yes. Phil? Yes. 
Uh, Denise? Yes. Ashley? Yes. And myself. All righty. Thanks.